All right. Good. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call back to order the uh, hearing from this morning of the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Um, since we are continuing from this morning, um, I think we we have a continuing quorum. And uh, I know people are in different committees this evening and have a lot going on at the same time. So some members will be going in and out, and that's just what happens this time of year. Um, and I see the cookies are down at this end. And once again, um, Lisa Timian from the Department of Health has brought cookies in for us. Share these? Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. Yeah, no, Senator Perryman, in fact. Yeah, they, they came down to you. They, they should have gone this way where the, the people one were. Can I just take all my partner's cookies? <laughs> <laughs> they can't and all the consequences of their cookies as well. I'm going to get a reputation. So there you go. All right. So this evening we are going to hear the presentation of the um, Department of Health budget. And we do have the bill. We have the actual bill. And I am the the author of it, but I'm just going to stay here and um, so I'm going to move um, House File 2930 that it be laid over for possible inclusion in the committee bill. And I'm also, if you notice members in your packets, there is an A1-1 amendment and the amendment in the packet represents the revised budget items. So I'm not going to formally move that amendment, but it is going to be before us for discussion um, as we hear the presentation of the budget and take testimony on the budget. So, um, and, and just uh, for those who um, haven't been through this process before, what's going to happen here is we're going to hear this bill, we're then going to lay it over. Um, we're also going to be hearing the Department of Human Services budget, uh, and later this week we're going to lay that over. And then um, some some of these budgets, uh, some of the items here, along with others, will come back in the form of an amendment. And it is our intention that House File 2930 is going to be the base, the vehicle for our omnibus bill. So. The number 2930 is, is the one we're going to be working off of. So with that, we're going to welcome Commissioner Cunningham to the committee to give us a presentation of your department's budget. So welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Thank you, committee members. I know you all have been already working into the evenings, another evening meeting, but we're happy to be here, uh, me with my team, uh, to present MDH's budget bill. So as you all know, at MDH, our mission is to protect, maintain, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. And in that vein, we have a robust budget package that has seven core domains that I will walk through quickly um, individually. And the first one is strengthening public health system and preparedness. Now, we know with the pandemic and what has often been said is that public health goes from panic to neglect. It has been historically underfunded and um, we were in an emergency able to get lots of uh, federal funding and, and state support, but we don't, you know, public health is more than just the emergency. And so the first budget proposal on your uh, page is about strengthening the public health system, both state, local, and tribal public health, so that everybody in Minnesota, no matter where they live, has the same public health services and protections. Um, a report last year also looked at a state's emer emergency preparedness overall. Um, it ranked states in high, medium, and low performance for emergency preparedness. And unfortunately, um, given what we have had with, with sort of public health funding in the past, Minnesota came up in the lower tier. And so again, both of these proposals are really to make sure we infuse 
our public health system with monies to do the day-to-day -day work, but also to respond and manage future public health emergencies, meaning the training, the staff, the supplies, the data to make sure that we have an effective response and are reaching the right people. As you all know, I shared with you my background um, and my interest over my career in health equity. We know the state suffers from some stubborn health inequities, particularly in African American communities and American Indian communities. We are proposing um, to start a new office of African American health and to include additional funds and an office started through COVID dollars, the Office of American Indian Health. Both of these groups, again and again, have some of the worst health disparities. Um, there are some similar reasons, but there are some distinct challenges and needs between both groups. And these offices would help us to respond to those needs, do some grant making, start a pipeline program, really, as we think about diversi diversifying the public health uh, workforce and to do some policy analysis. So we have proposals for those two offices. <clears throat> In addition, we know um, that improving the health and well-being of people living with disabilities is incredibly important. Uh, people with living with disabilities have challenges with health care access, health care discrimination, getting attention for their preventative care and their chronic disease needs, as often providers may only focus on their disability, um, not to mention the sort of built environments within health care systems. And so we have a proposal that proposes a robust agenda to uh, respond to improving the health and well-being of people with disabilities. We have another proposal that really wants to uh, build out and look at models for community health workers. Clearly, community health workers have been repeatedly demonstrated, uh, both in the literature and in experience, to be a good way to meet people where they are in their communities to deliver information, um, to educate, um, and, and even to, to um, share the cultural linguistic experiences of clients, clients to be more effective. So we have a proposal to really uh, work with the Community Health um, Worker Alliance to really look at the models for most effective community health workers. We have two comp proposals right at MDH. We do a lot of data. We do a lot of convening. We do a lot of grants making out to community-based organizations to respond uh, to local needs and to develop local solutions. As part of that, we interact with a, a wide variety of community-based organizations, some differentially positioned uh, to um, different capacity. Um, and this grant allows us to help build that capacity of community-based organizations. The first proposal uh, through resource allocation for them to build supports to be more effective state partners. The bottom proposal is really about the work at MDH itself. We want to be responsive to community input um, and to do more robust uh, community engagement. We saw how effective that was in the COVID response. We want to do more of that. We want to do that better. And this would help us in our own um, community engagement skills, not only at MDH, but clearly our core partners are local public health. Local public health, again, is in those earlier grants with uh, the public health system transformation with emergency preparedness, and clearly also as we work with community-based uh, partners. So uh, we're thinking about the whole governmental public health system at MDH. To reduce disparities, we'd also like to put in statute the HEAL Council, the Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council that has been operating um, since 2017 and hasn't been in statute, I think it's important for us um, to, that we have consistency with partners um, reflected in statute, equal authority and durability. This way, the Heal Council will be there, um, it be in statute, we can continue to turn uh, to those partners for their, for their input um, and to respect their participation in our processes with this advisory council. Um, DHS has a similar council that has enjoyed a lot of success 
we benefit from HEAL and, and would like to see it in statute. The next one on the slide is the all payer claims database. Um, the all payer claims database is an important uh, source of, of health information utilization in terms of claims. What it does not have is race, ethnicity data, nor dental claims. So uh, those are oversights that we'd hope to address uh, with all payers claims database enhancements. We have a proposal to increase cultural communications. Uh, Minnesota is a diverse state with a lot of um, people who speak different languages, come from different cultural backgrounds. We as an agency to provide the highest level of public health uh, services, education and resources really need to be able to produce information um, in different languages that is culturally congruent with different communities. This proposal would allow us to do this. This also pays attention again to people living with disabilities and includes monies for American Sign Language and computer assisted uh, real time translation services. There's another proposal for telehealth in libraries. We know about the broadband and the digital divide. We know uh, and, and with the release of the budget today, um, and those, those targets, there are some targets in there for broadband, but until that happens, right, there are many communities across greater Minnesota that have a broadband or digital divide. Libraries are a place where people can go and get on the internet. Um, but we have also seen, right, that navigating these uh, new portals, you know, telehealth, uh, my hope is, is here to stay, but navigating telehealth and getting on to do the video call with your provider is not always easy. So in addition to providing the technology, a telehealth and libraries pilot proposal can provide the people or the navigators to help people get on to make sure they get on to with their doctor um, and also have that whatever follow-up care that they might need through that health navigator. So. Um, there's that proposal with the libraries and, and probably would be of great benefit in particular to greater Minnesota with the broadband divide. We have um, another proposal for diversity, equity and inclusion. We know that uh, particularly post 2020, there's been a lot of interest in diversity, equity, inclusion across all, all organizations, all industries. Clearly you have to fund that to do that well and so we have a proposal really to help us with, with some funding to make sure that our policies, procedures, our strategic planning, our resource deployment takes into account diversity, equity, and inclusion. On here, we also have a homeless a proposal for homeless mortality a study. We have done some of the, the work in this space. Um, in 2022, we released um, a study looking at um, homeless mortality, and what it found was that the rate of death is three times higher among people experiencing homelessness in Minnesota than the general population. That 20 year olds experiencing homelessness in Minnesota have the same rate of death as 50 year olds. We like to continue to do that work and so there's money um, in our budget to continue that work. So we also have a couple of uh, new proposals uh, in the revised uh, budget that was released earlier this month. We have an equitable health care task force. Uh, this two year task force will examine inequities in how people experience care and their quality of care and bring partners around the table to really think again about how we get at stubborn health disparities beyond just access. Um, there was a seminal report in, in uh, 2001, the unequal treatment report released at that time by the Institute of Medicine that showed even with access, even with insurance, there were disparities in the quality of care and the experience of care. And this would bring people together to really think about how we tackle those together. Also in the revised budget, there's a proposal for fetal and infant mortality reviews. These were reviews that were at one time conducted by uh, the Department of Health. We'd like to restart uh, doing those again. Um, again, infant mortality is a challenge uh, for us in Minnesota as well as in the United States. And then we have HIV Prevention Health Equity Program. Um, um, without this funding, there, there are two epidemics 
um, with HIV in the state right now. Um, HIV again is, is is preventable and it's and it's treatable so that people don't progress uh, to AIDS. We have two epidemics. We need to continue to be in the space, and without this money uh, for HIV prevention, uh, we will lose lose some of the funding that we currently have from federal sources to do that work. So switching over to time critical prevention to address emerging or worsening health threats. Um, there will be a number of proposals that you all will see today that are around uh, mental health. Clearly the 988 suicide crisis lifeline um, is, is an important newer resource. We want to, to, to expand it, to do it better, you, uh, to enable chat, to enable texting. Um, in a more robust way so that anybody experiencing a mental health crisis, again, can get the support that, that they need. And so this will help us um, save lives through a quick connection to a mental health uh, resource. Next, um, align with mental health, clearly substance use is another uh, really challenging mental health problem, particularly with the opioid epidemic. Um, and so we have a robust package to really um, try to prevent uh, deaths from opioid use. This includes information about non-narcotic pain management, right, so that people use things other than opioids to manage pain. Um, we want to address substance use, particularly um, with people experiencing homelessness. Um, we want to address racial disparities in opioid use as there are stark racial disparities, particularly uh, with substance use overdose fatalities as well as non-fatal overdose at highest, highest rates in American Indian Minnesotans and then when African American uh, Minnesotans. We also want to be able to keep up, right? We are hearing reports pretty regularly about new types of substances like xylazine, that animal tranquilizer being introduced into substances. We have a strong public health lab. We want them to be able to, to keep up with, with these developments and detect new substances as they emerge um, in our lab. And we also, as we think about Minnesota's workforce, want to be able to support employers to support their employees who are in recovery or have a history of substance use disorder. So again, a robust package that does a number of different things to address uh, the opioid epidemic. Um, back to mental health, um, the next one at the top are some community mental health grants. Again, grants out uh, to uh, community-based organizations, um, to, to clinics and others, to to local health departments to implement, to work with community-based organizations to work on mental health. Um, next, we have the Climate Resiliency Package. Now, w, the World Health Organization calls climate change the biggest health threat facing humanity uh, due to extreme weather events, uh, disruption to food systems, um, the loss of life, increased vector-borne and zoonotic uh, diseases, um, and all of that, again, the impact on mental health from living um, through um, such, uh, such events. And so we have um, a robust package to prepare us to address the changes from uh, climate change and to build resiliency for Minnesotans with, again, grants going out to local organizations and local public health. Finally, as we talk about all these new sort of vector-borne illnesses, we, we need strong antibiotics, right? We need antibiotics that work. And so the last uh, proposal is about antibiotic stewardship uh, collaborative, which exists now but uh, could benefit from additional funding to maintain it. Um, speaking of zoonotic diseases, thinking about COVID um, and all the experience that we've had, um, a lot of people miss their preventative care, right, um, as life was disrupted. And, and, and for those impacted, most impacted by COVID are often those who are most impacted by health inequities and already had sort of baseline challenges to preventative care. So we have a proposal to really mitigate those barriers to get people back into um, community, to get people back into preventative uh, care, again, partnering with community-based organizations as well as um, addressing underlying social determinants of health that make seeking care difficult. Um, also with COVID, um, clearly for 
um, a good proportion of folk who have experienced COVID. Um, some have the sequelae of long COVID. And so we have a proposal to really look at um, some of the outcomes, particularly the social and economic um, factors as we are concerned with the social determinants of health for people who suffer from uh, long COVID. We like to be able to support those individuals um, at the Department of Health. Um, the next, uh, in terms of time critical uh, prevention, we have a proposal for Sentinel events, reviews for police involved deadly encounters. So MDH does a number of what we would call uh, mortality reviews. We do a maternal mortality uh, review. We mentioned just now the proposal for the fetal mortality review. This would be a mortality review using a public health approach to sentinel events for uh, fatalities and law enforcement encounters. Again, using us as a resource um, to really look at those events to see what is preventable from a public health approach. Um, and so we have that proposed as well. Of course, uh, legalizing adult use cannabis is on the table. MDH's uh, place in this space is really around prevention and education, particularly with, with young people um, and, and pregnant, uh, pregnant people. And so um, our piece of the legal, legalizing adult use cannabis really focuses on prevention and education. And so um, that is also there for your consideration. As we continue to think about, um, you know, young people, as we continue to think about making Minnesota the best state for children, we have uh, proposals for healthy beginnings, healthy families, and this is really to look at sort of uh, infant mortality, to look at screening and services, to look at pregnancy outcomes, um, to really expand the evidence-based family services for children of incarcerated uh, parents in county jails. And so it's really to really help, again, in partnership uh, with, with community-based organizations, local public health, and others uh, to make sure folks get a, the littlest ones get a healthy start, as it's titled. Um, a resource that MDH has developed for families and, and organizations to use is, is called Health, Help Me Connect, because again, much of the barriers have to do with sort of navigating um, the context, the social conditions in which you live. And we have a lot of visitors um, to this website called Help, Help Me Connect that has over uh, 12,000 community agency profiles. It has been uh, funded through a federal grant which will end uh, later this year if we don't have additional funding for that website. It, it has such potential to be expanded as even a referral platform and again to be a resource for individuals, for organizations, and for communities. Um, thinking again about um, families, we have a home visiting uh, program. Um, and this is an investment, again, that 90% of these monies go to community health boards, to tribal nations, to nonprofits via the grants for delivery of home visiting services uh, by qualified professionals. Again, home visiting uh, can be really helpful in identifying issues that actually can be mitigated um, so that kids and families can, can do better and get connected to resources. And so um, it'll serve children under five and provide greater flexibility and eligibility uh, to serve Minnesota's high priority populations uh, with expansion of this program. Also thinking about families, we have a family planning uh, budget proposal uh, which will allow us to counsel additional 20,000 individuals on um, contraception options and provide 17,000 people with fl family planning methods. I do want to lift this up for you. It's robust family planning. It's uh, preconception care, con conception care, screening and treatment for sexually transmitted infections. We have overwhelming demand uh, for this program and for requests in this space. So wanted to lift that up. 
still in the early childhood space, we have another grant program called Community Solutions. So uh, what you saw before in terms of uh, healthy, uh, healthy beginnings was really right at the very, very beginning. Community Solutions extend us out from the prenatal space to third grade. So um, healthy beginnings is more around pregnancy and right infants. This moves us out. Um, again, up to third grade to, to help families. And again, our grants out uh, to, to our partners really to, to be innovative and to think about the best way to support uh, families and, and children um, through community-led solutions. Next, we have an, uh, another grant in the mental health space really focusing on adolescents uh, with um, Adolescents' mental health, right? And 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 this is perhaps the the third proposal in this space. But we know the mental health crisis um, that we all need to respond to. Uh, let me share a few numbers with you. Twenty nine percent of students um, in our last student survey reported long term mental health problems. Twenty nine percent. Twenty eight percent had seriously considered suicide at some point in their life. And, and a number of these kids identified as LGBTQ+. And so those numbers are some of the highest that we have seen in our survey. Um, and so again, just speaks to the volume of our mental health challenge. One way to reach kids is through school health. So the proposal on the next page that you have is about um, supporting and expanding school-based health centers in, in, in Minnesota as a place to, to reach kids. Um, the next two proposals on your slide talk about lead, right? And we know the impacts of, of, of lead. I know you all have had um, some presentations on lead already, but uh, we need to do a lead service line inventory to avail ourselves um, of the funding that's part of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's um, funding platform to remove lead. So we need to complete the lead service line inventory. And then the bottom proposal, so that that middle one is about sort of community water systems and with community partners. And the bottom one is specific about child care centers, right? Again, with the impact of lead happening uh, most profoundly on, on our youngest Minnesotans. So we're gonna switch over into health care, access, affordability, and quality. Clearly, um, health care costs continue to rise. This really proposes a, a commission to really think about how can we sort of uh, be smart and, 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 and address the ongoing rise in health care and health care costs uh, with a spending uh, target developed by a public-private health care spending target commission. Um, as we think about spending, um, in 2020, we had the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. Um, that was a, a great start, but unfortunately, the data to really get at what the drivers of the cost of prescription drugs are incomplete. We need more data, actually. Um, we need data from wholesalers, pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, we need more information about uh, rebates and so to really understand the supply chain and everything that is contributing to costs, we would propose expanding that so that we could get that that data and give be out better information um, and help us all think about policy solutions to prescription drug costs in Minnesota. When we think about costs on the federal level, we've seen the No Surprises Act at MDH. We are sort of responsible for the No Surprises Act enforcement, right? None of us want to be caught off guard with a high medical bill. And so, um, but we need the funding to do the enforcement and we, and we really don't have that. And so um, the No Surprises Act enforcement proposal will, will give us um, the monies to, um, to enforce the No Surprises Act. With healthcare, um, and when we think about access and care experience, as I've spoken to, we have to think about the workforce, right? And 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 the challenges in the healthcare workforce space, um, particular, and also the challenges, particularly in in Greater Minnesota, um, uh, rural settings have their own particular challenges uh, with healthcare workforce. Uh, we try to meet that and understand uh, workforce challenges through research, but we also have a number of programs to address those challenges 
uses. And so this is what that uh, proposal intends to do um, to address uh, the, the workforce through, through research data and programs to build out the, the workforce, particularly in mental health, but also particularly in uh, rural areas. Um, we have a couple of things that, that uh, we would like to, um, to repeal. Um, one would be the annual chronic conditions report. Um, the data for there just, just isn't making that a meaningful report. Um, and so we would ask that uh, we repeal the annual chronic, cost, chronic conditions cost attribution report. report. Um, similarly, um, we're, we're doing a lot of work as I've sort of shared with you all and so we, we also feel like the women's right to know and positive alternative programs at this point um, should also be repealed. Um, we recognize the importance of comprehensive, accurate information in the space, but we're doing a lot of work already, and so um, that work is duplicative at this point. Um, the next, um, we have two other uh, proposals in our revised uh, budget. One is that um, we've all benefited in terms of COVID, in terms of having free vaccines, particularly those who are um, uninsured or underinsured or have challenges and, um, in getting vaccinations due to, due to cost. And so um, the traditional vaccine program is really, outside of COVID, is really all about providing vaccination to kids. But we want to make sure that adults have access to vaccines too. And so we have included uh, some funding um, to provide recommended vaccinations for adults um, in our proposals. Um, next, we would like to um, continue a program um, that provides funding for training of providers. And so we are asking to preserve some funding for medical education and, and research costs. Um, there have been some changes at the federal level which have changed the funding uh, for those streams. Um, and this <coughs> proposal also includes um, some monies for dental innovation, which of course is um, important as we think about folks' overall health. So let me switch over to uh, current service needs and federal compliance. Um, and so as part of the governor's budget, um, we, are, we are quite thankful uh, that the governor is taking into account uh, the operational adjustment that agencies need. So we have included and are looking for you all to support our operational adjustment to just maintain our current service uh, needs. And so there's a proposal that you all will see there. Clearly, we want to make sure that um, um, our assisted living, licensure, and home care, that we're able to meet the demand um, to ensure proper funding and oversight of vulnerable adult care. That's critically important. Um, and there are a lot of, there have been higher than anticipated regulatory re um, requirements in this space and demands. Um, fees will not increase with this, with these new monies. And so we are hoping that um, you will um, consider including this as you all move forward in terms of protecting our, our older and, and vulnerable, um, older or vulnerable uh, adults um, with our insistent living uh, regulation that MDH does. In addition, um, we really want to, you'll see a couple of other uh, proposals uh, subsequently around uh, water. Here's one that is, is budget neutral, which is about reinstating the Drinking Water and Wastewater Advisory Council. We would like to see that council reinstated. It expired in June of 2019. There's no new cost to reinstate the council. We know how important drinking water is, and so that is there to consider. Um, in addition, as we think about um, the work that we have to do in partnership um, with healthcare provider organizations of all types, there we are requesting a trauma system fee adjustment. Um, this, the current trauma system base fee is $1,000. We would like to increase that to $1,826. There's a bed fee that we are hoping will go up from 
$12 to $23. There have been no fee increases since I, I believe the program um, back in 2000s. So um, I think we are due time, particularly given um, what this requires to maintain a robust trauma system in, in Minnesota. We want to maintain industry standards uh, with that. There are a couple of um, other changes in terms of when vital record surcharges are remitted to MDH. I'll let you all read that. Um, clearly, we're all important. We're all concerned with uh, fiscal accountability, and there is a proposal to um, to to help us give us additional support and staffing uh, for federal funds oversight. And so, uh, put that in. Um, happy to see that in as well to support our operations. Again, we give out a lot of uh, community-based grants and grants to local public health, grants to a lot of partners who actually do the work on the grant, on the ground for us. And so having some additional uh, support and, and managing funds on our administrative side would be helpful. Um, there is an information and telecommunications account extension, it's, it's budget neutral and really a reallocation of funds from 2023 uh, to fiscal year 2024. On the um, operations side, we also know that background studies have, have, have increased. Um, we continue to conduct them, want to continue to conduct them in accordance with federal and state requirements, but more and more provider types are required to submit background studies for new hires. Fees have, fees have increased. This, these monies would just help us to sort of keep up. Um, there's also a telehealth study that is ongoing that we would like to um, just, again, um, shift a portion of the funding from fiscal year um, to fiscal year 2024 to ensure completion. We've seen the importance, you know, probably each one of us individually of telehealth during the pandemic. It is the new way in which care is being delivered. We have a talented group of uh, health services researchers which are really providing information to the state about um, how it promotes access, quality, uh, value, and innovation and helps us address health inequities that would like to be able to uh, complete that to complete that work. Finally, um, the last uh, bucket that I'll move through relatively quickly, uh, there's only one proposal that um, is in the general fund. The others are in the clean water fund. The first one in the general fund is again about strengthening public drinking water systems infrastructure. We want to make sure that we have the uninterrupted delivery of safe water to communities. And so there are a number of methods that we can do that. And so this would uh, provide funding uh, for that. And then with the clean water fund, um, clearly the lab again wants to be able to detect contaminants of emerging concern, right? We want to be able to identify um, problems in our water as they emerge. Um, we have funding for to develop a multi-agency uh, statewide drinking water plan. Um, we have a plan for groundwater restoration and protection uh, strategies. Um, we have an appropriation uh, proposed um, to for additional lead service line inventories and program administration in terms of the last one on that uh, page, which is also general fund. A lot of um, Minnesotans are served by private wells, and so there's a proposal to really um, address water quality for private well users. About 1.2 million Minnesotans get their water off of a private well. Um, Folks, when they recreate, often want to know how the quality of the water when they're going to right the, the beach. So um, this would create a statewide beach portal, allowing Minnesotans to go online and see the quality of the water where when they're doing recreational activities. And then another uh, proposal to protect uh, source water. And so with that, um, there's some numbers um, on the back slide. I really appreciate you all's uh, attention here. Um, thank you, Chair Liebling, committee members. Um, that concludes my presentation. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner. And um, 
You know, I think it's, uh, first of all, uh, uh, an awful lot of work to assemble all this, and thank you and thanks to the staff for doing that for us. And I think it really, this quick run through, and it was only, what, like not even 40 minutes, but it really kind of shows the, the breadth and depth of the things that the department does, even though it's a pretty small department, honestly. So appreciate that very much. So um, we're going to take testimony then uh, from a number of folks who have signed up to testify. And so I'm just going to call you up in the order in which you're on the sheet here. And we only have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people signed up. So um, we do want you to be brief, but we can also give you a little more than two minutes if you care to, if you care to have that. What I would ask folks to do is if you are able, if you're referring to a particular proposal to please orient us and tell us what proposal in this package you're talking about so we can all follow along with your testimony. So first up will be Allison Zelmer. And then as you come up, you know, if many of you know the drill, but if you don't, you know, just to please introduce yourself for the record, tell us who you're affiliated with, if anyone, and then go ahead and give us your testimony. Welcome. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Allison Zelmer, and I am the Director of Emerging Programs at AMPAC. AMPAC is a nonprofit organization that manages many of our state's AmeriCorps programs. This evening, I am testifying in support of House File 2930, Article 1, Section 2, and Article 2, Section 47, Funding for Public Health Board. I want to thank Chair Liebling for including public health care in last year's omnibus bill. And we are excited that the governor again included it in his budget recommendations. Public Health Corps is a partnership between AMPAC, Serve Minnesota, and the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Public Health Corps places trained AmeriCorps members in county public health agencies to accomplish <coughs> two key goals. First, they help expand the capacity of our local public health agencies to better support our communities. And second, they create a pipeline of future public health professionals. With a priority on serving socially vulnerable populations, our public health corps members are doing community engagement and community health needs assessments. For example, members serving in Bloomington within their public health department are coordinating communicating, conducting, and analyzing focus groups, and engaging community members in outreach to identify opportunities to advance health and racial equity. They are also helping revamp communication processes and updating language access plans and services to non-English speaking community members. The partnership with the School of Public Health is also providing public health core members with training and career planning in the public health field. Members learn about career opportunities from these public health professionals, as well as receive one-to-one -one career coaching from our staff. This is important because 81% of public health core members want to pursue a career or further their education in the field of public health, and 56% of our members are interested in working in greater Minnesota. This is an incredible opportunity to address the needs in greater Minnesota that those communities are experiencing. We are all aware of the needs in our communities and the challenges that staffing shortages have placed on our local public and community health agencies. With this appropriation, we can leverage federal AmeriCorps funding to help address these critical needs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, Suzanne Wheeler, and then uh, after that I have Patty Bowler and Billy Hamlin. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Hello, I'm Suzanne Wheeler. I'm president of the Minnesota ME-CFS Alliance. I'm a U.S. Army disabled veteran and a mom of three women. I live in New Hope and I'm a person living with MECFS, which is myalgic encephalomyelitis or otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome, and which is a post-viral illness similar to long COVID. 
As COVID-19 and its variants continue to affect Minnesotans, long COVID is emerging as a crisis. Many of those with long COVID also receive the same diagnosis as me, which is life altering. Some are homebound, some people are bed bound, unable to work or care for their own families and are in significant amount of chronic pain. Current resources at the Minnesota Department of Health are an inadequate to address the impact of long COVID, which may have affected as many as 20% of infected Minnesotans with COVID, including children and adolescents. Disproportionate impacts have been felt in the black, indigenous, people of color, low, impact, low income, rural, disabled, and elder populations, and more data is needed to understand these impacts. The governor's budget proposes funding to raise awareness, develop consensus guidance, and support long COVID survivors. I urge you to support this funding as it is critical to Minnesota's response to this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Patty Bowler, then Billy Hanlon, then Twyla Brays. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Chair Liebling and members of the committee, my name is Patty Bowler and I'm Director of Policy and Healthy Communities for the Minneapolis Health Department, and I also serve as the Legislative Co-Chair for the Local Public Health Association. So we wanna thank you for the provisions in the bill that protect health and prevent adverse health outcomes. But I wanted to highlight, there's, there's a lot in the bill, but I wanted to highlight two provisions that are of highest priority for the Local Public Health Association. First, we appreciate the inclusion of the public health system transformation, which is Article 1, Section 2. Our health departments have varying capacity across the state, and this $15 million investment will help local and tribal public health departments have a foundation of capabilities in place. Things like community outreach, uh, the ability to collect good data, communications. All of these things ensure that uh, we're always ready to serve our communities and achieve equitable health outcomes. We're so grateful for this inclusion of the provision and we hope that you'll uh, consider increasing the investment to match a bill being introduced by Representative Acomb to $45 million a year to address the significant health needs of our communities. Secondly, we appreciate the inclusion of the local and tribal public health emergency preparedness provision at 8.4 million, which is again Article, two, section, Article 1, Section 2. We are grateful that this provision closely mirrors Representative Hewitt's bill on this topic. Emergency preparedness is a mandated activity of all local public health departments and it's historically only been funded at the federal level. And since 20, 2009, federal funds have been reduced drastically. <coughs> For instance, the Minneapolis Health Department's federal EP funding, funding barely covers our staff expenses. We rely on seven community-based organizations to help with emergencies, and often these partners have the trust of resident, residents more so than governmental agencies like the city. We don't, however, have any funding to pay them for this work. Investing state funds in emergency preparedness will not only increase the capacity of the preparedness programs, but also let us better reach our communities. Thank you for continued support of our local public health system and the important prevention-focused programming that will improve the health of Minnesotans. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Billy Hanlon. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, good evening, committee. Uh, hello, my name is Billy Hanlon. I am the Director of Advocacy and Outreach for the Minnesota MECFS Alliance and a person living with MECFS. A high percentage of long COVID patients are meeting the diagnostic criteria for MECFS, which is what brings me here today. 
Long COVID is a public health crisis that is severely impacting hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans physically, professionally, emotionally, and financially. It is having an enormous impact to the labor force participation rate in our state and is detrimental to the health of our state's economy. It is worth reiterating today that these infectious associated diseases destroy identities, futures, families, and careers. They continue to be vastly underserved, underfunded, under-resourced, understudied, and highly marginalized, leaving a strong feeling of medical abandonment. The Minnesota Department of Health resources to continue to address this long COVID crisis are inadequate. The supporting long COVID survivors and monetary impact budget proposal by Governor Walls that was articulated from Commissioner Cunningham will help MDH bridge some of these inequitable gaps. This proposal will help with funding towards raising awareness, developing consensus guidance, and supporting long COVID survivors and communities. This funding is crucial for Minnesota's response to the crisis. I implore and sincerely urge you to support this critical proposal and recommendation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Um, okay, uh, Twyla Brays and then Mary Crinky. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, can I just ask one question first? So there's a DE amendment which does not have the COVID language in and the uh, original which does. Am no. I testifying to the original? No, so uh, we have the bill before us which is the, the Department of Health budget. Yep. The amendment that we're also discussing is their updated budget. The DE I mentioned is not in existence yet. Got it. So that the DE, essentially the amendment that will be to this bill, which will represent the actual omnibus bill. All right, Madam Speaker, I will, <laughs> Madam Speaker, very good. Madam Chair, <laughs> I will uh, go to the original bill. Please. So, thank you. Um, so my, I have uh, just a few concerns here. One of them has to do with the long COVID section. Most of my concerns have to do with uh, privacy issues within the bill. So one of them is just the, the long COVID piece. Um, it seems to us like it is creating, it is a whole research project. And but Ms. Brace, I don't think you introduced yourself you for the so record, correct. if you would. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Twyla Bray, Citizens Council for Health Freedom. Uh, our mission is to protect patient and doctor freedom. So regarding the long COVID section. So my concern is with, it is starting a research project, but it's not at all uh, um, known or clear exactly what's going to happen to the data, how the data is going to be collected. Doesn't appear to be that there's any consent. When I look at section 66 lines 97 to uh, 98, what we have here is that it's going to monitor trends in incidence, prevalence, mortality, and health outcomes, care management and costs, changes in disability status, employment, quality of life, service needs of individuals with long COVID and detect potential public health problems, predict risks and assist in investigating long COVID health inequities. And then it's got this whole list of uh, partnerships from schools to long term to long COVID survivors, to the departments, to community organizations, to insurers. And so we don't understand exactly what is happening to the data here. And at least one of the questions that I would ask is if if this stays in here, whether it is going to be going to the Judiciary Committee to have all the data issues dealt with having to do with this long COVID section. So Ms. Brace, what, do you have a line that you, are you actually looking at the bill here at the 2930? Mm -hmm. And what Sec line are you on if you could just direct 97.9. Okay. And it goes to 98.14 and it's section 88. Okay, thank you. So, um, so anyway, that's our concerns with that. Um, we don't understand what's happening with the data. We do want patient consent for whatever uh, kind of research is done. And we'd like it to go to judiciary if it's going to go forward. It is a $3.146 million program a year. So it, fe it feels like us to us that's a lot of money being spent and probably a lot of data being collected. So um, that's our concern with that. Um, I'll say just two more things about data privacy, the social determinants of health language. For those who don't understand what that is, if, if you've ever looked at a list of what social determinants of health are, it's like everything in your life, uh, essentially from um, 
your transportation to your housing to education to income to health to everything and our concern is that social determinants of health are being talked about with electronic health records and that electronic health records will become essentially a dossier of the person's life uh, with the with a call from health plans or hospitals or whomever to collect this data into the electronic health record. So that's a concern. We keep seeing this language pop up, social determinants of health, but it's popping up that it's not only departments and the government that would collect all of this extensive amounts of data, but also the electronic health record. And, and you, then once the- Once again, can you direct us to a, a line if you have that? So I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, but I don't have that, but okay. it is mentioned several times Got throughout it. the bill. Okay. Education, behavioral, several things. Then the, the last thing which was talked about by the health department is the all-payer claims database. Uh, we've never liked it because obviously we have privacy concerns uh, and the idea of adding um, dentists to it and having um, dental uh, care added and dental data added uh, as well as race, race and ethnicity, um, you know, we've never liked it so we're, we're not going to like those pieces being added uh, to it as well. And then the very last thing that I have to say has to do, because um, I listened to the commissioner talk about, you know, give her testimony there. And, um, and I just wanted to point out something that health affairs talked about in a study done by Harvard on trust in public health. So there's a lot of money. It's important that, that public health, trust in public health be restored. And right now it's not. And so here's a quote from their article in health affairs. The top major reason reported for lower trust across agencies, and that was CDC, state, and local, was public influence on their recommendations and policies cited by roughly three quarters of those with lower trust in each agency. And so I just uh, recommend to the chair and to the committee and to the health department that whatever can be done to increase the trust of the public in public health uh, would be a very good idea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, um, Mary Krinky. Welcome. Uh, Madam Chair and members for the record, my name is Mary Krinky and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. I just want to mention three provisions to you tonight that are in the governor's budget. The first one is um, change page 165 and I'm referring to the budget pages here instead of the bill. So change page 165, MHA supports the revitalizing the healthcare workforce section of the governor's budget. This includes funding for rural training tracks, mental health programs for healthcare providers, education loan forgiveness programs, and the International Immigrant Medical Graduate Training Program, all of which are key workforce provisions that, that we hope can get across the finish line this year. Um, they were part of the governor's budget last year and we're, we're hopeful that they can get done this year. Um, the second item that I want to mention is change page 218 and I was pleased the commissioner mentioned this today. It is a little confusing, but MHA strongly supports the Merck program, medical education and research costs. And the program has to be moved from MDH to DHS and this is because of a new CMS rule that ties the Merck program to Medicaid medical assistance funding. So this, the program has to change locations. And I just want to say that we have been very supportive of Merck, and we know that we need to train physicians here in Minnesota to get them to work here in Minnesota. And so this is a very important tool for training our next generation of physicians. And the last item I want to mention is on change page 22. MHA favors the governor's approach on creating a healthcare spending growth targets commission. Rolls off your mouth, doesn't it? Healthcare spending growth targets commission. Instead of a more aggressive approach found in House File 2202, which gives a newly created independent affordability board the authority to po impose civil penalties on a provider. And we're very nervous about the possibility of an independent, not government entity being able to impose civil penalties on providers. So those are the three items I would like to highlight tonight. We are continuing to review House File 2930. It's a pretty big bill and there's a lot in there, but those were our three highlights. Thank you, Madam Chair.
All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, um, those are all the testifiers who have signed up, but um, is there anyone else in the room who wants to testify on the bill? Now's your chance. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody, so we will close testimony then and go to member discussion or questions. Is there any member discussion? Kind of quiet. Everybody must want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Don't all talk at once. Um, okay. Madam Chair? Yes. I'll say something. Representative Smith. Uh, just something very quick. I think it's very telling that in an evening uh, committee meeting where we all want to go home, that a lot of our um, testifiers tonight talked about long COVID and the need to remember. Uh, remember those people and it's easy to remember now that we're past the hardest part of uh, the pandemic um, and think that we're past that but a lot of Minnesotans are suffering for that and I think that's something there's a big bill with a lot of great stuff um, but I just wanted to comment on uh, how powerful I found that that uh, again on a Tuesday night uh, we had a lot of people here talking about long COVID and the need for us to take care of those Minnesotans and not forget about them. All right, thank you, Representative Smith. And I should note for members that we do have a lot of letters in our packet as well, which uh, is very important for folks to, to read those. Uh, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I don't know if this uh, question would be for you, Madam Chair, or for the commissioner, but I guess, I mean, if we're talking about long COVID and, and the, the importance of relief there, does what kind of relief does this bill provide um, from a regulatory perspective for nursing homes or long-term care providers licensed by MDH? Um, well, um, I, I don't know that I saw that in the bill, but it's, it isn't my bill. Yeah. Although I'm carrying the yeah. bill, obviously, but I don't know if the commissioner or someone else from the department wants to come down. Um, Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I should not have put myself in the back row in the middle. So, and could you state your name for the record first, mm -hmm. Madam Chair and members of the committee? My name is Diane Ryderick. I'm the director of the Health Policy Division at MDH. Um, and Madam Chair and Representative New Brindley, uh, this budget proposal does not include regulatory relief um, for nursing homes. It does include a provision, as Commissioner Cunningham noted, that allows us to um, fully carry out the oversight that is already our responsibility for assisted living and home care providers by right-sizing the appropriation so that we're able to provide um, the regulatory oversight that we're responsible for, which also includes training that we provide, webinars, other educational supports for those providers. Okay. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, does does the bill reduce any of the assessments or fines on nursing homes? We've been seeing really, you know, particularly through the pandemic, when obviously everyone was squeezed, and it's been an ongoing problem for our long-term care providers. Um, is there any relief for those long-term care providers in their assessments and fines? In the in the governor's proposal, Ms. Ryderick, um, Madam Chair and Representative, um, this proposal does not decrease any fees. Um, it keeps them at the same level, both for licensure for assisted living and home care providers, and for background studies. Um, so it keeps those fees the same. Um, we have had conversations with some of your colleagues about those concerns around fines that are levied against long-term care facilities, especially those that happened during the pandemic. Um, this bill does not cover that. We're exploring some options with some of your colleagues to address that. Great. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just looking at uh, page four and the, the FTE changes that we have in the governor's proposal, if I'm looking at this, that's the final line in the report there. We're projecting about 1,703 for uh, the end of this fiscal year, and if the governor's proposal was put in place between the two years of the biennium, it would be about 1,976. Um, if I'm understanding it right, that would be somewhere between a 16 and a 20 percent increase in the total number of FTEs. And Representative Schumacher, which document are you referring to? Uh, the. Are you in the change pages? I sure am, yes. Okay, and what page was it again? Uh, number four. Okay. Okay, and I don't know if we want to get, probably get the commissioner back to. Okay. To, I mean. Is that directed to the commissioner? Yes, since it's her proposal. Okay. Or to the department anyway. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Margaret Kelly, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. I don't yet have the revised version of the budget in my notebook, but happy to hear the question again and can probably answer. Yeah. Is the question just okay. about the percentage increase in FTEs? Yeah. Could you could you repeat the question, Representative Schumacher? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, gladly. Uh, it looks like on page four of the, the change pages, the full time equivalents on the last line, by the end of this budget year, we're looking at 1,703. Uh, FTEs for this, and in the governor's recommendation between the two years, it it averages out to 1,976, which would be uh, about a 16 percent increase. There, am I am I understanding that right, or am I reading that right? That's really my only question. There, Ms. Kelly, did you get a chance to catch up here? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, your able staff here helped me out, so thank you. <laughs> um, those numbers are correct. There is a, an increase. The, the proposals here require people to carry them out, and so there is an increase. There is some amount of that that's continuing and maintaining staff that we currently have in the, uh, due to the operating increase. Uh, I don't know what that exact breakout is. But those numbers are correct. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I understand, especially in the Department of Health, probably more than any other department we have in the state, that these full-time equivalents move from different funding areas to fill out those those pieces and that they get moved depending on what priorities may be or, or where we're at. How many actual physical people will there, would there be projected or how many more actual hires would you be anticipating in, in this? Director Kelly. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Schumacher, I would have to get you that breakdown. Um, how many are part-time versus full-time, so two part-time people is one is, is one FTE, but two people. So how many actual people will actually be needing to hire? I have to get back. Yeah, and Assistant Commissioner, um, Representative Schumacher made a statement about moving people around, and I, I can understand that impression because during COVID, I know the department move people around because there was an emergency and, you know, I know a lot of people ended up, you know, having to do work that maybe wasn't their primary reason they were with the department. But is that, could you just comment on that? Is that something during normal times that happens or is that people kind of, you know, work in an area and stay in an area? Because obviously there's, a, as, as I said before, there are a great many activities that the department is responsible for. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to clarify that. When folks are hired at the department to do a job, they, they stay in that role uh, so long as their funding is maintained. Uh, people move from area to area as they change jobs. But you're correct, Madam Chair, during the pandemic, we redeployed almost three quarters of our workforce from the work that they were hired to do to COVID response work. Um, we have almost all of those individuals back in their, what we call their day jobs. 
uh, with a few lingering redeployments remaining. But when somebody's hired to do work, they typically stay in that job unless they change jobs. Okay. Thank you. And I, I think that, um, you know, that response that the department was able to muster by moving people around was, you know, I mean, to my mind, nothing short of heroic. I mean, you know, I always um, like to remind folks that the Department of Health is really not that large of an agency. And um, so we were called on to do an awful lot over the last few years. Thank you, Madam Chair. And many of those employees are here tonight, so I appreciate that. Yeah. So other questions or, uh, oh, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the department for this uh, great presentation and all the information. I just have a specific question in the area of um, improving the health and well-being of people with disabilities. Um, we have $2.6 million there, and when I look at the change pages uh, starting on 122, uh, there are a lot of strategies, and they're good, you know, half a dozen uh, related to data, to planning, to grants, and so forth. My question is that people with disabilities, it's not a, a single thing. There are so many different directions and different unique needs depending on the type of disability a person has. So I just want to ask uh, how that's being factored in because to me, uh, this was one place where I felt maybe the um, funding uh, was maybe not all that it might be. Uh, thank you. Uh, Assistant Commissioner or someone else wants to come down? I'm going to phone a friend, madam. Okay. <laughs> and thank you all. We have such a wonderful team, Madam Chair, in the audience. Like, there are a number of people who could, who could answer the question. Um, I will t I will take it. But, okay, you know, Commissioner, please. People. So, um, <laughs> so a friend could join me if I don't, you know, answer completely. But but thank you for for bringing that up. I think it's such, uh, Madam Chair, it's such an opportunity for us to to really engage in a more robust robust way with that diversity of experience, in terms of people who are living with disabilities. Um, not as with any group, right? It is a heterogeneous group in terms of both the condition that creates the disability, but also the living, the circumstances in which people live, right? And so I appreciate your call that perhaps, uh, Representative, uh, that perhaps we might think about, you know, the level of funding, giving all of that diversity. But uh, what we are trying to do is to get a better foothold in a robust plan, the data, um, as one thing, a comprehensive strategy, engaging uh, community partners, you know, those who are most impacted by uh, disabilities, as well as um, a partners across the state enterprise, healthcare, to really think about how we can address um, the, the health and well being of people living with disabilities better than we are doing today, and to get a start, a better start. So, so I appreciate that. that. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, anything further? All right. Um, any closing comments, Commissioner? I think we're. I, I think the committee has kind of used up its questions for now. Well, well I well I appreciate it. I appreciate um, uh, Chair Liebling the time to come in to present this budget. We have been waiting, as you all have been waiting, to share it with you all. Again, the whole team is over here on this side of the room and have done a lot of hard work to really think about uh, protecting, maintaining, and improving the health of all Minnesotans. I'm going to check the math on the FTEs. Um, the one thing that I would say is that uh, within the agency, we have seen um, a lot of our vacancies go, go get filled over the last six months um, and even longer than that. So I had asked uh, for some numbers as I started as commissioner in terms of our vacancy rate. And over the last six months when I asked for those in January, we had filled over 300 positions. I think that, so that says, so that gap between 1,700 and, and 2,000, approximately 300 positions, I want to assure you that I, that I think um, this work is important. The FTEs that undergirded are important. 
that I, I believe we can fill those FTEs and again uh, serve the state of Minnesota um, in a way that again invests in public health so we interrupt this cycle from panic to neglect and, and just are there for all Minnesotans across the state. So uh, Madam uh, Chair, I really appreciate the time. Had many members your evening. I really appreciate the time, so thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and I think that really speaks well for the agency that you can attract and hire that many folks and fill those vacancies because a lot of, uh, there are a lot of places where they're having a lot more trouble, and um, so that really does speak well, I think, for the Department of Health that uh, so many people want to come and work for us, so that's really great to hear. All right, so uh, thank you again for, for this, and thank you to the entire staff of MDH for all your work and for putting these proposals together, and um, thank you to the testifiers as well. And uh, do, you know, we are, are happy to continue receiving written testimony and comments. Um, and let me just say that these, this budget and the one coming from the Department of Human Services, there's a lot in here. And we really do appreciate your comments because it helps us, you know, really understand what's in here. This is a big job. So um, that is all, it's all helpful to us, um, and we appreciate that. So with that, House File 2930 is laid over for possible inclusion. And um, so I think that concludes our business for the evening, and we are adjourned. <laughs>